Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Rocket Live. I am here today, joined by my good friend and colleague, Mr. Jason Ellinger, who is the co-founder and magic maker with Beard and Baller. Jason, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, my friend. Yeah, um, I, uh, I've i been waiting to actually do this interview with you for a while because, listen, it, it's one of those things. Like, there's a shared kind of kindred spirit that we have. I mean, we've known each other for a bunch of years, but, you know, it's sort of that whole, like, you know, production guy and production per, you know, it's a whole thing of being involved in a video production world. And so it's like there's a certain bond and shared spirit between, you know, everybody in the professional video world. You know, we. We, we we have sort of an unspoken language, I think. You just kind of look at each other and be like, yep, I know. You've been through it. <laughs> Feel your pain. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, but it's all good, man. And uh, yeah, I am I am happy to have you on today. And um, I'm really looking forward to having this chat. So let's dive into it. As I always like to say, every superhero has an origin story. So I would love to know what your superhero origin story is and how you got into this wild and wacky world of video production a la filmmaking storytelling so kind of began in 2007 um, when i started my video production company aj video productions and uh secretly that was uh all jason <laughs> video production like i wanted to do it all myself right um just in time for the 2008 recession so it was tough couple of years to navigate um, but fast forward I'm getting married um, I wanted to have a bit more stability uh, took on a day job working for the news uh, I was a hard news photojournalist had the 4 a.m. to noon shift and uh, I saw a lot of death and destruction around New Jersey and New York and uh, it just started kind of chipping away at my soul I felt like I was adding to the noise and that doing more harm than good um, so I found a guy who was in probably one of the worst areas of the state and he took two empty plots of land and decided to start a community garden. And in doing that, he, he wasn't even a nonprofit yet. He was, he was 70 years old and he decided to do this on top of a full-time job that he already had and nothing would even grow there, uh, in his community farm. So what he did was he took, he brought in his own dirt and, uh, created the garden like willed it to live you know he's across from two burned down buildings and uh every other weekend he'd hold a farmer's market you can't afford to donate just take a bag mm -hmm. of vegetables of fruit you know a very a light in a very dark area and uh eventually the community around him started building back up like the the uh the buildings that were burned down got repaired and fixed up Mm -hmm. I started doing like a f community fridge where people would just bring food and other people who needed it would take. So it, it just like really started to build up the area around him. And I was like, if I could tell that story every day, that those are the types of stories that I, I would tell. I brought that to my, my kind of my guide, my Yoda, I called him, uh, <laughs> who's my now business partner. And I pitched that to him. He's like, I'm in, we've got the why let's figure out how to, make a living at it, you know, and not even like, right. let's make bank. It was like, how do we live and tell these stories? So, um, we, we ended up doing probably one of the most important things you can do as the business is niching down mm -hmm. and we niche down to, uh, nonprofits, uh, but okay. of a certain magnitude of nonprofit that, uh, had events bringing in six figures or more. Those are the ones that could really support, mm -hmm. um, the type of video work that we were doing. And then also, um, cost justify it within their event. Um, right. And then keep using it as a fundraising tool for years to come even. So that's our, our, the nutshell of our origin story. I think that's the quickest I ever did it. Um, but that's kind of how Beard and Bowler came to be. And uh, in marketing to nonprofits that have great stories that we want to tell, our mission is to uh, tell stories that are going to inspire others to positive action. Mm -hmm. In marketing, just to those that demographic, we've kind of attracted the right type of for-profit businesses and agencies right. that, that really want to tell their story in that same sort of fashion. So, um, that's how, that's how we came to be. I love it, man. I mean, I, I, uh, I really love that story because I, I like that, you know, that 
like everybody has the moment, right? You know, everybody has that moment in their life that sort of sets them on a trajectory that you would never, ever anticipate, right? I mean, that's life, right? You, you can't, this is why, you know, people spend so much time planning things out, but it's really the unplanned things that are going to happen to you that will most of the times when you look back, make the most impact in your life. So, you know, you sharing that moment really resonated with me because of, you know, I've had similar instances. I'm sure anybody else listening or watching this right now has had that similar instance or experience that they went through that's, that made them think, wow, this is, this is actually what I want to be doing more of. But not only do I want to be doing more of it, I'd want to be doing it more like this. And so I think that that was, that's a really key part of like your origin story that you just shared with me, uh, with all of us actually. But I think a lot of people can relate to that because it is, it is something I think that happens more often than not with, with most people where, you know, you're like, Hey, I want to do this as a career. And then something else happens in that journey that puts you onto a sort of a whole other path, um, same path but slightly different, you know, and a different way of going about it. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I think that uh, a great follow-up question based on what you were just talking about, how you sort of incorporate, you know, what you do with your style and and your your niche as far as what you do in video production. But I would love, because I know that you guys have a strong foundation, so I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. Um, what do you consider to be the key elements of, let's just call it that authentic storytelling, you know, and how do you incorporate that into the work that you do? Um, key element. There's actually seven of them. And um, we actually do talks on these for, for nonprofits in particular, because uh, you know, it's video is that mystery, even to marketing agencies who've been doing it before, right? It's this oh, yeah. thing that you can't understand and grasp and a lot of times there's no process to working with independent artists they get burned you know everybody gets burned oh, yeah. so oh, yeah. imagine a nonprofit world right <laughs> yeah. so we we do talks on the seven elements of story and basically uh, disney picks are are like at the top of this game mm -hmm. i have these store these movies like memorized and broken down down to when it's going to uh how how long it's going to take for credits to roll right because yeah. it's timed that much just to hold the tension throughout the whole thing mm -hmm. um but the seven elements of story is um you have a hero who uh, has a problem and they need a guide and that guide gives them a plan and calls them to action and that action ends in either a comedy or a tragedy and that's the way every movie every television show every good book is written with that sort of formula and if you stay within that formula, you can create and craft something that will keep audiences engaged until the very end. Um, if you stray from that, it there are very few instances where there's successful movies that have strayed from that. And yeah. I mean, I've said it high level, but once you fully grasp it and start mm -hmm. to study it and realize that every, not even just every show but every scene inside of every show has some sort of problem and solution right your mind is just blown even even in commercials sure. and that's the those are the elements of good storytelling um i said to my crew the other day like why can't ne uh why can't marlin excuse me from finding nemo just go find nemo he just says swim to the other side of the ocean just go find his son right like right easy so he he goes gets attacked by three sharks gets swallowed by a whale, finds a field of jellyfish, gets swallowed again by a pelican. Like, if there is no problem in your story, we lose interest. And when the overarching problem is is solved, when he actually finds Nemo and, and brings him back in, it's a few minutes to roll credits because we check out after that. Like, okay, oof, it's over. I don't need to pay attention anymore. So we've just taken that formula and kind of reverse engineered it for real people um, to to fill out who the character is, who the guide is. Uh, very important on who those two are. A lot of businesses and organizations kind of position themselves as the hero and they should be the guide in, in the scenario. And uh, the most important part of any story is the problem. So making sure uh, whoever our hero is can clearly articulate what the problem is that they're facing. And uh, we do some pre-interviews and a couple of pieces of, of other of, uh, of our process to help ensure that we know that they can. But um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the secret sauce right there in a nutshell. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, it's one of those things like uh, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And I mean that, you know, the 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 elements of storytelling, you know, are are rooted in uh, in the human history. You know, like as far as our evolution goes, and you know, the, any from from the time of you know creating like uh, you know drawings on the inside of cave walls to when we can you know actually pass down narrative um, explanations for things from one another, all have followed the very simple principles of just telling a story, you know, like, and listen, yes, to your point, there are different ways to do it. And, and, you know, whether it's switching things around or, but ultimately at the end of the day, like the story is, is still, you know, the basic elements of telling a story aren't going to change. There's, there's nothing to change really. I mean, it's just, that's it telling a story and, it, and it's all in how you tell it. Right. And, and making sure that uh, it does, follow a structure and these are the things that you know have worked we see them work as you just said whether it's tv uh film commercials but it gets the audience invested you know and invested enough where they want to follow the journey and then have whatever the the conclusion or payoff is by the end but like you said by the time the credits roll or it's done you're like whoo i was right there with them the whole time and that that makes for a successful you know story it, what in whatever medium you know it's not just movies like but that storytelling element is is ever present in just about anything that we you know all consume and watch you know i want to talk a little bit about um working i i think that when you're you know when we talk about the differences between like working more commercial or corporate or you know the measurements as far as the success of a video, a lot of times lie within, uh, you know, whether it's views, likes, calls to action, um, you know, there's a lot of measurements there because a lot of times, you know, from a, from a corporate or commercial perspective, there's sort of that like end goal of like, go buy this now or click here to do this thing or what on so on and so forth. But in a world of nonprofit, I mean, there are some similar crossovers, but how do you, really measure the success of a video for a not-for-profit you know and what what kind of metrics you know are you looking at or are you designing the videos to do based on that because listen everything has to have a strategy behind it no matter what right i mean because you know people are hiring you to do things for them their organization so there has to be you know a desired result other than just like hi i'm just just make this video and put it up on my website you know they're 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 there is an end game to it. So I would love to get your perspective on, on that. Funny because with not uh, for profit, there are very specific goals um, that are typically thought out ahead of time and KPIs and all this marketing <laughs> jargon, <right? laughs> marketing <Yeah>. jargon. <laughs> Sometimes views are one of them. Engagement is another one. How many people yeah. filled out or at least made it to the landing page, made it all the way through, stayed on how long they stayed on. Right. Right. Uh, and nonprofits, nobody is really measuring that at a smaller, medium level. There are a few who have it together enough to do so. Right. Um, but they're they they don't have the budget. It's, it's a shame because, you know, we, we look at every dollar we give to a nonprofit should be for, uh, you know, going to program 100 percent to feeding the homeless. And they have right. their own budgets and people that are working well below what they deserve in most yeah. cases. And it's almost frowned upon when market uh, nonprofits, you know, market and, you know, we're, we're okay with like a startup spending a million dollars to advertise their new shoe or product or whatever. Right. But like, right. Yeah. Nonprofit tries to spend a quarter of that to tell you about the, to make you aware of the issues that they are solving and changing the world. Like yeah. we freak it. So all of that to say, you know, it's, it's a shame that that happens. So there's, there's not really a lot of infrastructure within nonprofits, most of the nonprofits that we work with to, to really track that, or even the personnel to track that. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we try and do is we actually have pretty strict guidelines on who we work with. And for us, that bar is making sure that they have an event that's bringing in a decent amount. And I mean, decent amount, at least six figures or more, mm -hmm. um, so that we know it's going to be cost justified, uh, number one. And number two, we know that the money is in the room. So much so that if somebody were touched by a video, they could possibly dig a little bit deeper. And right. we measure it with how well they did this year versus 
versus how well they did last year at their fundraising event or gala. And that's our biggest measurement that we use. Um, that's not the only one. Um, if, if they don't have an event, but they have a really good director of development who's connected with corporate donors and can get it sponsored or underwritten, cool. We'll, we'll work with them. If they have a really active board, um, which is becoming a rarity these days, but if they have a really active board going out and doing their job in fundraising, then um, yes, we could work with them because these are the tools that you'd use similar to as if you were in a sales position. You'd bring a tool like this out with you to be like, hey, this is who we are in three minutes or less. Or as a follow up to a conversation you had, hey, just wanted to show you that piece that we discussed when we were meeting. Um, let me show you. And that's essentially what a, a director of development and a board are doing is mm -hmm. sales. Um, so giving them and arming them that, with that tool is, is where we can really help out. But one of the main metric metrics, like I said, is the, uh, is the fundraising gala. And if that group of 300, 500, a thousand people that we've had in the audiences here at these places, are, they are voting with their dollars. Right. And if they are not moved emotionally enough to do so, then you'll see that reflected in, in the donations. And sure, there's a lot of other factors, you know, maybe they, right. they botch the moment right after the video plays where you have that 30 seconds, you ask the audience, whatever you want. And right, you know, right. there's, there's, there's occasions where that happens, but like they will, people will vote with their dollars and they give with their heart. Same way we buy with our heart and mm -hmm. post rationalize it later. Like ah, you didn't need that, that, that. Oh, I need the SUV for, you know, the snow and I have children and this thing, you yeah. like the SUV. You were attracted, you bought it, you wanted it, and you bought it, and then you came up with those excuses later as to why, you know, to justify your expense. And we do the same thing as, as humans to when we feel moved enough to give to somebody. So, yeah, and that those are, you touched on a lot of interesting points there. And I think that that's also worth talking about further is, um, the actual importance now. I, I, I feel like, you know, I, I'm sure people have probably seen it and they're probably sick of hearing it, but you know, it's really true that like, you know, content is King. And when we're talking about the world of nonprofits, that being able to make that connection with folks on a much more emotional level, you know, really at the end of the day, like video checks all those bases, right? Cause you're getting an audio and you're getting a video component all wrapped in one. So you're, you're, you're touching the different senses, you know, two, two of the main sense and senses all at once. And, and you were talking, you know, now when you wrap storytelling into it from, from what you were talking about, I think that it becomes really powerful in that way. And this is where I think a lot of not-for-profits and this is where I think you guys help out a lot because of the storytelling component, that fact that you can take a story, you know, and find clips and little things like that, that then a non for profit can use. And actually, you know, we're talking about making investments, right? But the investment can go a lot further when you start thinking about the different platforms and things that you can take advantage of between TikTok. We were talking about it off YouTube shorts and, and YouTube itself and all the other social media platforms, Instagram reels, like, you know, you don't have to think so in the box or linear that like it's a 90 second edit and it's 60 seconds or it's five minutes long or here's the gala cut. But it's like you can have the gala cut. You can have the the reels cut. You can have the five pieces of content for TikTok. Like there's so many ways to, to use that content and get it out there. And I would say that for anybody watching, listening, if you're involved with enough for profit and you haven't done video yet, like or have or you've been on the fence about it or think, oh my gosh, this is going to cost me, cost us an arm and a leg. We can't do it. Like, it's really one of those investments that I, that I think at this, in this day and age, like you have to make, you know, in an organization, if to your point, you want to increase donorship, uh, donations and, you know, get more dollars flowing into your given cause or organization, you know, um, and you know, from a charitable point of view like you know like you, people have to know about it <laughs> they have to know about you and your mission if they're gonna if they're gonna donate to it right and they have to feel connected to it and i think video you know i'm sure you agree with that video is the like one of the best ways to do it yeah it's uh 
I mean, our large gala videos are not really for everyone just because of budget or if they're a two man team and all volunteers or something, but absolutely everybody can do video. And, uh, we've actually started doing classes or, or workshops and talks, uh, for the smaller nonprofits who have that one man communications team or half man communications team yeah. and, uh, really just how to get started with your phone or let's say a few hundred dollars of equipment that you can use with your phone, mic, lighting, mm -hmm. uh, gimbal, maybe, or a little tripod, uh, wherever you're at. And I, I tell people all the time, sometimes we have to give them permission. Like you can use your cell phone. It's okay. You know what we do when we're on set with a crew of six and two cinematographers and lighting and audio and all this without my cell phone and I think behind the scenes yeah. of uh, us on set and that's sometimes our social media occasionally yeah. we are you know uh gifted enough to have a, a behind the scenes person with a camera you know but a lot of times it's just like hey let's get the cell phone let's capture this let's take a photo let's do something and that that will work um and most of our package to your to your point like there's so many things you can do with it we saw this like i want to say three years ago we started doing uh snackable content included in our content in, in our packages basically you have one long form i mean long form like three-ish minutes and, right. and three snackable pieces included in the content so it's you can have almost like little movie trailers that lead up to the big piece for social media for email for digital um, or, or other platforms. And it all depends on where your target audience is too. If you're going to use a TikTok or YouTube shorts, which I'm loving right now, Facebook reels is apparently making a comeback because everybody left Facebook and there's, there's a hole to fill there of content, uh, and content creators, um, or Instagram, if you want to try and dive into the oversaturatedness of, of Instagram right now, but, yeah. um, depending where your target audience is, is depending where you're going to put some of these snackable pieces in the midst of like another campaign with, with other photos and stuff and full on strategy, um, is what we recommend. But we just, we, we saw the need for that and, and social being like a huge component. So right away we're like, we need to make this a package and then shoot efficiently enough so that when they inevitably ask for what they didn't think they need in the, needed in the beginning that we can pull like a dozen social pieces from this if we needed to, um, you know, a la carte after the fact. So yeah, I'm very strategic about, about, uh, the smaller content. It's the way to look at it. I mean, and I, that's what's happening and it's not going away at all. In fact, it's going to become more, <laughs> it's going to be more and more platforms, more content, um, uh, making your message go longer uh, further, uh, by, you know, really using, you know, the mediums. I mean, it's, it's, we are in a, I only want to say we're in, you know, we're in a video age anymore. I mean, video is not like, it's not like videos ever got away. It's just how video is consumed, um, on, and on what platform and that's it. I mean, it's, it's just always going to be another platform that's going to utilize video. And if you're not, taking advantage of video in one way or the other, whether it's working with a company like you guys, or like you said, like using your phone and, and creating content like that, just to bring people in to connect with them, you know, tell the stories, right? The, I mean, businesses of any shape and size, any organization, you have lots of stories, you're sitting on them, you know, the people you work with, the people you're helping, like that's when you go, I don't know what to make content about. I get, I hear that all the time. I don't know what to make content about. I'll tell your story. Like you have an interesting story. You've done stuff. You've lived through things. Use that. If you don't know what to talk about, like always, you know, there's always that at the end of the day, you know, there's stories out there that can be told and used. And that's, you know, one of the things that I think is, and that usually really relates with people on a much more deeper level than any, you know, elaborate marketing speak, <laughs> you know, from that level. Um, I got a question for you. Here you go. Here's a good question for you. What are your favorite types of stories to tell? Ooh. Um, and I know you, you know do. I, I know you have them because every filmmaker has the stories they love to tell that, that reach them, that they like to tell. So I know there's, I know you've got one or two. <laughs> we, 
our specialty is real people storytelling. So um, anything documentary style is is where we're at. And, and whenever the person gets emotive, like emotional, and um, even we can tell for the pre-interview that's going to be do it's going to be good. We do pre-interviews with all of our people just to make sure that they're going to be able to clearly articulate the problem. Um, from the time of the pre-interview, if they start getting emotional, um, they've opened up and it means something to them. Whoever's helped them, whoever the guide is, nonprofit or for-profit, um, is just, you can tell where the impact was made mm -hmm. almost immediately. And sometimes people, I'm like, hey, could you say your name and spell it to start us out? And yeah, the tears start flowing within two minutes of that. And, uh, you know, some of it's nerves, but a lot of it is just like they know they've been preparing for this moment. They've got this story to share of immense impact. And uh, the 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 best ones that I like to tell are the ones that the person was like here before they met the the guide or the organization or the even the brand. And then the brand guided them to a point where it was like radical transformation. You saved my life. Save my marriage. You saved me from becoming a drug addict. You saved me from X, Y, Z, and that power statement that we get and we usually put at the end. Like, I don't know if I'd be here today if it wasn't for X. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that multiple times in in our storytelling, in our pre interviews and stuff, where just literally life saving work. And it's not even just nonprofits. We had a a pharma company who we worked with through an agency last year. And um, what they did was release a non-opioid product that helped people with knee surgery so that it was essentially a nerve blocker. And uh, it you could see where people would have been. Some Somebody talked about it like I would have been alcoholic. I would have been a drug, drug addict. I was cooped up. I couldn't go anywhere and I didn't want to be addicted to pills, you know. And um, so all that to say, even even big pharma, small pharma, however you want to say it, yeah, there are stories of impact everywhere and within brands. And I think one of my favorite quotes is like your is is um, from Sarah Elkins. We spoke at her conference a few years back, but it was uh, your story doesn't have to be epic to be meaningful, and uh, that just stuck with me. Um, we, we kind of undervalue our story and um, what we have to offer. Sometimes we think it doesn't matter. It's not going to resonate with people. And you'd be surprised if you're speaking, let's say, to a room of two or 300, what one person picks up that really resonated with them and spoke to them as opposed to the power statements and the facts and figures that you're going to drop on them. And it's just that little element of story that you, you had to tell in the beginning, right? Because <laughs> it's your story. But like, you'd be surprised how many people resonate with that. And you, the yeah. thing is, you don't know who's going to resonate with what unless it's out there. So right, very important to keep telling your story, stories of impact you've seen. Mm -hmm. Very important love it i love it i i agree with that 100 percent. you know um so going back to the origin story a little bit uh before we before we wrap things up i think everybody you know you had the moment right in there that set you on a path to where you where you've gotten now but let's dial it back a little bit further what was the moment that you realized that you wanted to do tell stories, make video, get involved in film production. Was it a movie? Was it a, a book? Was it a friend? Was it something on TV? What was the, what was that, the spark that lit that lit the creative fire in you? So the, it's always been brewing there, right? Since high school, um, when the varsity coach asked me this little punk eighth grader to tape the games so his players could see how they were performing if they were taking shots if they're running plays right and he gets the footage back and he's like what are you doing i wanted you to go left and right left and right. you're zooming in <laughs> you're going wide. Your crash zooms here dipping out and 
He was like, what are you doing? Like, just keep it simple. And I just, I couldn't help myself. Like I became so fascinated with it because almost everything I picked up, I could, I could, I don't want to say master, but like I could really learn it quickly. I was a very fast learner. Yeah. And video was one of those elements that was just, there were so many facets involved from even on the technical side of things, from lighting to shot composition, to focus, to color, like mm -hmm. audio, adding that into it. Like there were so many different dim dimensions that were like, if you were to take a still photograph, you'd, you'd, yeah, it takes skill to take good photography and, and frame it upright, but like add eight other elements on top of that. And oh yeah, don't forget about story and the way you tell it. And it was just, it drew me in. And some of my favorite movies, like growing up, we didn't have cable. So I had the the WB-11 remix with the censored versions of Aliens and Predator. And uh, <laughs> those, were, those were my favorite movies specifically because you didn't get to see the monster or the alien until the very end. Yeah. And that it left it to your imagination. It left the tension in it in there. It didn't relieve it in the first 20 minutes where you're like, oh, okay, that's that's what we're dealing with here. Like there was that element of mystery where like you were only seeing little slivers of this, that, or the other and tail, right? And like I know that's a weird comparison, but that that kind of taught me how to keep tension in uh, uh anything that you're working on until the very end. And um I can't really say that there is a catalyst that was like, this was the moment um, because I've always had a fascination with video, but definitely that story of, of Willie was like the, what, what are we going to tell? We, I felt this right. urge to make a difference and I knew I'd only be able to do that within stories like Willie, the urban farmer from Patterson. And uh, I felt if we could get his story out, in front of the eyes, maybe the soccer mom from Wyckoff decides to start her own community garden somewhere nearby and, and become like a positive influence. And I felt this strong urge to just um, make a difference through storytelling. And I felt like that was the best way to do it was through video. In the digital age, social media age, stuff's being shared instantly, like the best way to get any kind of positive message out there. Love it, man. But you said it all. You said it all. So uh, for those who are watching and listening, uh, Jason, what is the best way to get a hold of you and Beard and Bowler? Uh, so you, you can check out our website, beardandbowler.com. There's a contact form. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn every day. Jason Ellinger, five days a week we post content. Um, I reply to like almost every single comment. So <laughs> that's the one way to get a hold of me. Um, we just launched the YouTube shorts campaign. If you look up beard and bowler, you'll see it. And we have content there three times a week. So we spend a lot of money in marketing dollars, not on marketing, but trying to add value and tips and tricks for the nonprofits who may not be ready for us right now. We wanted to give away as much of it as we can, um, to help people on their journey to inspire others. Awesome. I love it, man. Well, thank you so much for, for spending some time with us today and for uh, chatting with me. This this was great. Um, we'll have to do this again for sure because uh, I know there, there's so much more we could dive into for sure. Scratch the surface. We're just scratching the surface. No, I love it. But uh, yeah, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, it it's you, you guys do great work and I've been, you know, I've been wanting to have you on forever to at least uh, start to begin to have the chat of, uh, you know, picking your brain and seeing what goes on inside that head. <laughs> cool man appreciate yeah. it honored to be on the show yeah you got it absolutely and thank you all so much for for watching and for listening to us wherever uh you get your podcasts uh we are of course available on all podcast platforms and you could also watch the video versions right here on youtube so thank you all so much for watching and remember always be authentic always be yourself and always remember to rock it